Hey, welcome to Foundation Church. My name's Justin Graves. I'm the pastor here. We're glad that you're with us today. And we are starting a new series called Parenting in the 21st Century. Parenting in the 21st Century. And if you are not a parent here today, your tendency is you want to check out. And I want to tell you, don't check out today. Because what we're sharing, what I'm sharing today is very applicable whether you have kids at home, whether you're newlyweds, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a college student, I'm coming for all of you today. So um, just so you know, so today we're going to be talking about popcorn kids and cell phone parents, popcorn kids and cell phone parents. And next week, I want to let you know, we're going to be talking about how do you, how do you, how do you stay a kid in the 21st century? How do, you, how do you be a child in the 21st century? So parents, if you have a teenager, a college student, if you've got one, an FC kid, you need to get them here um, because I'm going to say the hard things that you've been saying for a while, right? So hopefully it gets reinforced, but it's going to be a great four-week series that we're doing. And so I'm just telling you, every week's going to be very, very applicable. Um, as we start this series, there's a disclaimer I want to make to you. As I share and we start, I start speaking on parenting in the 21st century, I, I want to let you know, I am not a perfect parent by any means. Um, there is a reason when I go to basketball games, I don't wear anything that says foundations, church, or Jesus, um, because I'm in my dad mode and in my element. Um, and so I, I just want to let you, I am not perfect. I am not up here. Like if you could just be more like your pastor, you would never screw up. That is not this message. That is not the series because the simple truth is this. Most of us, if we were to be honest, when we had little babies, especially all the men here, we were just trying not to drop them, right? Like we were like, if I just don't drop them on my head, that's a win. And once they get old enough and they start hitting the twos and threes and on, we're just trying not to screw them up. I mean, really, we're just like, okay, if I can just not screw them up, we're way ahead of the game. And so today, I'm going to start today with the end in mind. Like, we're going to start with the altar call, which is kind of weird for some of you. Like, wow, really? Um, and in the seat back in front of you, for every parent, for every grandparent, uh, no matter what your age may be, you're going to see an index card in the seat back in front of you. If there's not enough in the seat back in front of you, that's okay. Um, here's what I'm asking you to do, parents. I'm asking you to write your kid's name, write your grandkids' names on these cards and let us know how we can pray for your kid or for your grandkid. That's what these cards are up here from our first service. Um, if there are not enough cards, you can use a Connect card. I see a Connect card down here. So, um, But here's what I, the reason I'm telling you this now, we're going to, when we do baby dedications, we bring our kids down here and we surrender them to the Lord, right? We just commit them to the Lord. And we're kind of doing that through this series. Just we want to give you an opportunity to know that your staff's going to be praying for your kids, for your family, all throughout this series because prayer changes things, right? Like prayer, let's do that again, second service. Prayer changes things, right? Yeah. Prayer changes lives, it changes hearts. And so we want to give you a time to do this. Remember at the end of the service, to come down and put this down. But we gotta get going because I am way behind time because we had 10 people get baptized. That is fantastic. So, <clears throat> so we're a little pressed for time today and we're not gonna get out at one o'clock. So there we go. Um, I wanna give you three must-dos as parents. Three must-dos as parents that we're gonna dive right into and the first point is this. Be the parent. Be the parent. Stop comparing your kids. Stop comparing your kids and stop trying to keep up with other families. Be the parent, stop comparing your kids, and stop trying to keep up with other families. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 through 9, we read this every baby dedication, says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Moses is talking to the adults. He's talking to the parents. And he says this, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Why tie these symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads? What's Moses meaning? He's meaning this, don't let this job and don't let this role get away from you or be something you forget to do. It's that big of a deal. Don't let this be something you, that gets away from you or you forget to do. 
This passage of scripture is a parent's job. Let me, let me say this, and I'm, I'm gonna come really hard at this point. Parents, it is not the church's job to raise your child. Right, it's not. It's, it's not the church's, the only, the only time your child or your teenager hears about Jesus is on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, you've missed the mark. You've missed the mark. Here, here it is. Parents, it is not the school's job to discipline your child. Every teacher better say amen right now. Amen. Right? Oh, our schools are just falling apart because parents aren't doing their job. Amen. You know, as The Rock would say, shut your mouth and know your role, right? Like, understand what your job is, what your role is. It is to be their parent and not their buddy and not their friend. You're called to be their parent. You're called to be the mom or the dad. And here's why, because they only have one mom and they only have one dad. If you're from a mixed family, right, and, and there's been a divorce and there's step-parents, hear me. It's not about you trying to be the cool parent and then be the bad parent. That's not fair. That's not right. Grow up. Amen. Told you, we're coming in hot today. <laughs> Grow up and be the parent. Stop trying to be their buddy, because here's what I will tell you. If you will be the parent now, you get to be their buddy later. Right? My dad is one of my best friends. Comes to church, sitting in the back left. I've already seen him because I know I'm going to use him a lot in this series. So cut, buckle up, pops. But can I tell you, we're great friends, and he's one of my best friends now because he was a great dad when I was 0 to 18 years old. He, he's still a great dad. Some of you are like, what happened when you turned 19? Um, but <laughs> it was very well established what his role was. He was... He, there was moments he was going to, mid-high, I thought he was going to kill me. Um, if he would have been allowed to baptize me, he would have drowned me. Um, but <laughs> it was just bad, right? But he stayed in his lane. He knew his role, and it wasn't easy at times. It wasn't fun at times. But my mom and my dad stayed my parents, and they weren't trying to be my buddy. And hear me, Joshua chapter 24, verse 15 says this. And if it's evil in, the eye, in your eyes to serve the Lord, Joshua was saying this, to the whole nation of Israel. Choose this day whom you're gonna serve. He's drawing a line in the sand. He's setting the standard for the whole nation of Israel, whether your gods, your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, there's a little, there's a little bit of attitude, I feel like Joshua's saying. But as for me and my house, right? Like, oh, I know where we're, what we're doing and where we're going, right? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is the last speech Joshua gives to the nation of Israel. He's well advanced in years, and he's still leading his family. You don't get to check out of being a parent. It is a 24-hour job. And for us saying, oh, I'm so tired of adulting, well, buckle up, because it ain't going away. I'm not saying you don't need downtime, but you don't get downtime from being a parent. You got to step because your kid needs you to set the standard and set the bar. They need you to set the standard and step, set the bar. They don't need you to be cool parents. Chances are, if you're a parent, you're not cool anyways. My, my, my whole statement is this. Once you turn 27, you're no longer cool. Um, some of you are like, Dad, I mean, it's just kind of sometimes reality, right? You're posing, but... Parents, you don't need to be the cool parents. Don't be the parents where all the kids come over and throw their keys in the car and you get the alcohol for them. Grow up. Be the parent. Set the standards. Don't do what you think's good and what's cool. Do what actually is good and what is right and what leads them to Jesus because that's the role you're supposed to play. You're supposed to be in that primary role. So own it and stay in your lane, right? Second thing is this. Stop comparing kids. Throw a picture of my family up real quick. If you don't know who my family is, this is my family. Um, Chloe is on my left, Charlie is on my right, and my wife Casey is on the end. And when Charlie was a baby, she came out and she was fantastic. She was easy, she was sweet, she was nice. Um, you guys remember Baby Wise back in the day, right? Like she was the Baby Wise baby, man. I mean, she went down at the right time. She ate when she was supposed to eat, slept when she was supposed to sleep, pooped when she was supposed to poop, did, did everything right. And then came Chloe. 
And I gotta be honest, when we were parents of just Charlie, we thought we were the greatest parents of all time. And if your kid was acting a fool at Walmart or Target, we were like, how, you're, you're pagans, right? Like you're <laughs> peasants of parents, don't you read, right? <laughs> There's a book out there called Baby Wise that fixes all this. And then Chloe was like, I got your baby wise and I'll raise you, right? Like, she just blew it up and we didn't know. And here's why I'm telling you this. We had to learn really early on what worked for Charlie didn't work for Chloe, all right? We still have learned what works with Charlie doesn't work with Chloe. What works with Chloe doesn't work with Charlie. They both have different strengths. They both have different weaknesses. And thank God they aren't alike. And my job as their dad and my, your job as your kid's parent isn't to compare your kids and say, why can't you just be like your brother? Why can't you just be like your sister? Why can't you just be like your sibling? If you could only be more like, can I tell you what happens is there's resentment that starts building up and you unknowingly start developing a favorite. And if you will go back and read the Bible, when there's favorites in families, it becomes dysfunctional very fast. Go back and read the account of Joseph and the coat of many colors. His dad set him up for failure because he was the favorite and the rules were different because there was, stop comparing your kids and let your kids strive being who God has made them to be. The last thing is this, don't try to keep up. Don't try to keep up with other families. Stop it. Like we start looking around at other families and we start stressing out and we think our kids behind and man, their family's doing this and their family's doing this and their kids are doing this and grandparents, their grandkids are doing this. And their kids already have grandkids. And their kids have this many grandkids and we start comparing and we start looking around. Parents of newborns, when you hear other parents talk about their child and their baby, they start saying things like, yes, my child started walking at three months and started to roll over at two weeks old. Their baby sleeps through the night at one month for 10 hours and is already into intermittent fasting and has a six pack. And if your kid doesn't, you're like, what, what are we doing wrong here, right? My baby just got a belly, doesn't have a six pack. Kids. The parents of like kids that are around six years old, you hear parents say, my kid's six and is already paying, playing competitive basketball, has four NIL deals, plays the piano, and is fluent in almost two languages. And you're looking at your kid just trying to keep them from eating the cat poop from the kitty litter because he thinks it's <laughs> jelly beans. You're like, son, that's not jelly beans. You're just trying to keep your kid from tripping when it runs as fast as he can, right? And you're like... What do I do? What's wrong with my kid? Nothing's wrong with your kid. Your kid's being a kid. What's wrong is you're comparing your kid to other people's kids. Parents of teenagers, here's what we do. Uh, my kid's on this sports team. My kid has this GPA. My kid's taking this many honors classes. They scored a 32 on their ACT, has been accepted by 10 different colleges, has this many scholarships, ha will already have two years of college by the time they graduate high school before they even step on a college campus, and you're just praying your kid graduates. And we're like, oh, what are we doing wrong? The thing you're doing wrong is that you are comparing and you're trying to keep up with other families and other people's kids. And hear me, everybody loses when you compare. For all of those married people out there, many of us, we are comparing our marriage to other people's marriage. Stop it, because here's what we do when we compare. We compare our real life to their highlights. It's not even a fair comparison. You're comparing your real life to their social media posts. That's not real. Even be real is not real. Some of you are like, what's be real? Don't worry about it. And it doesn't go away. We do this as singles. Well, I'm dating. They're not dating, but, but look who they're dating. Look who I'm dating. Well, you probably don't need to date them anymore if that's how you feel about your boyfriend or girlfriend already. This is it. Like, no, then let's be done, Right? I'm single. I've, I've got this job. They've got that job. And I love this passage of Scripture. It's right after Peter gets re, like, reestablished by Jesus, re-put in, like totally redeemed by Jesus after he denied him three times. Jesus has this long interaction in John 21, verse 20 through 22. It says this. 
Peter turned around right after being re, re, reinstated and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved. Which I always think, John's, this is such a jerk move by John, right? Because he's the one writing this, the disciple Jesus loved, right? The one who leaned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? And Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? And Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Why is that your business? As for you, follow me. Can I tell you, your job, my job, it, why do we care what God is doing in other people? Our job is to follow him. Not to compare our calling, not to compare God's blessings in our life compared to, compared to their life. Your job as a follower of Christ isn't to worry about what God is doing in other people. It is to worry about what God is doing in you. And for you to own the role and be the role and be the follower of Christ that Jesus has called you to be. To all of you parents out there that you are busy comparing, I love this quote. It says this, popcorn is prepared in the same pot in the same heat, in the same oil, and yet the kernels don't pop at the same time. Don't compare your child to others. Their turn to pop is coming. Can I tell you, you got popcorn kids. And maybe you're like, but Justin, they're 18 years old and that kernel's cold still. <laughs> you're like, it's time to pop. It's time for you to turn the heat up maybe. You got popcorn kids. Can I tell you, God's got a plan for them. God's got a purpose for them. And your job as a parent is to lead them to that purpose and for them to understand what God's will is for them. Second thing is this. Understand, parenting in the 21st century, consistency is crucial. Consistency and, and discipline, consistency in showing up, consistency in the way that you talk, consistency in how you handle losing your temper, parents. Here's what's crazy to me. We want our kids not to talk disrespectful to us, but when we lose our temper, everything goes out the door. Consistency is key. Consistency is crucial. Titus chapter 2, verse 7 through 8 says, In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. In everything, set them example. Set them an example by doing what is good. Here's my question for you. If imitation is the greatest form of flattery, do you want your kids imitating your real life? If imitation is truly the greatest form of flattery, parents, do you want your kids living your life out? Are you okay if your kids turn out like you did? Because here's what I have found. Parents, you can't act like pagans and expect your kids to turn out like saints. But we do it. Oh, don't, don't, don't do what I'm doing. Just listen to what I say. But here's what I'll tell you. You know the number one thing teenagers hate? Hypocrisy. Be real. Be gen just be who you're going to be. If you're a screw up, just lean into that and own it. Oh, I screwed up again. All right. What they don't have tolerance for is you not apologizing and you thinking you're perfect when they see everything that is imperfect, right? Because they're listening to your words, but even more than they're listening to your words, they're watching your behavior and they're watching the way you act. And man, we can make kids do what we, because I said so, because I'm your parent. And there's times you gotta do that, especially when they're little, and you can submit them into obeying, but can I tell you a way better way to lead and to live your life is for them to see you lead and to live your life a certain way because then they wanna follow. And man, it is way, it's a way better way to live your life because understand, you reproduce who you are, not your good intentions. And that's a big deal. Oh, but I got great intentions. Well, everybody's got great intentions. But parents, you, re re you reproduce who you are, not what your intentions were. Consistency is crucial. 
when we're going and we pick out a cell phone company that who we're going to use and what we're going to do, usually we go and we're looking for a cell phone company that has the most consistency, right? We don't want drop calls. When you can't get a signal or you drop calls all the time, it becomes aggravating. It becomes frustrating. You get mad at your phone. You throw it down. Maybe that's just me, right? But, but you get frustrated. You talk louder. Can you hear me now, right? It's like that doesn't help the signal, right? But, but most of the time when we're looking for a cell phone carrier, we're looking for who has the best coverage because we don't want drop calls. And parents, you can't be a cell phone parent that drops your role and drops your consistency when the time's not right or when the time's not fitting or when you're not in the mood or when something's not going your way. You and I are called to be consistent followers of Christ. And hear me, just as teenagers don't like parents that are inconsistent, we have a world that cannot stand inconsistency. You can be genuine. You don't have to be perfect, but they want us to be real. And as followers of Christ, it's a huge turnoff. When we go out of this church and we leave and we're the rudest person at the restaurant and we tip the, tip the least. We tip the least. That could have gotten bad really fast. Right? It's, they're like, but, but wait a second. There's no consistency to it. I tell you, this world's starving for followers of Christ that are just consistent, that you're not just checking your Christian walk at the door when you walk out of church and you're like, okay, it's time for me to put on my other facade and the other person that I am when I'm not at church, right? And some of us, I've heard this said, well, Justin, I just, I just don't want to live out my Christian life out there because I want to have fun. Okay, so when Jesus said that he came to this earth that you may have life, he didn't say that he came that you may have a life that's unfun and lame, right? That's not in the scriptures at all. He said, I came that you may have life and have it to the full, right? If you're not having fun, if you're not living this life out in a powerful, remarkable way, hear me, you're doing it wrong. You're not living this life out the way God intended it because I can tell you, for the most part, I don't have a dramatic testimony. For the most part, I follow Jesus pretty close down the line and I've lived my life and I've got crazy stories because I was a good kid that did a lot of dumb stuff, but I've got no regrets from the way that I lived my life. And some of you, if you're saying, Ma, I, just, I, just, I don't like that. In fact, I got time. Can I say this story real quick? The other day I was out in the lobby Two ladies come out, and, and I'm like, they knew each other, but they didn't want to talk to one another. And I'm talking to them. I'm like, so, so wait, wait a second. How do, you, how do you ladies know each other? Oh, we used to club together. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. Now we're getting somewhere. What clubs? You know, I'm like, what were we doing? What were we doing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, like, ah, woo, right? Like. It became awkward. So it's like, oh, like how long ago? Oh, like a week. <laughs> I was like, okay, now it's awkward, right? Why is it awkward? Because we're not consistent. We're not consistent. And consistency as a parent, consistency as a follower of Christ, I mean, it's crucial. It's crucial. Last thing is this. Parents, if you're going to parent in the 21st century, you've got to stay in a position of prayer. You've got to stay in a position of prayer. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 through 12 says this, and I, I love this for parents especially. It says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. To every mid-high parent, don't just to pretend to love your mid-higher. Really love them. Right? Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. What if we did that at our home? We took turns and we took delight in honoring, each other, honoring one another instead of tearing one another down. Never be lazy. You don't get to check out of being a parent. You don't get to check out of being a husband, of being a wife. But work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Man, can I just echo that point? Keep on 
praying. The most powerful position you can live your life in is a position of prayer, parents. The most po- one of the most powerful, underused attributes and weapon that a follower of Christ has is prayer. And the Bible keeps encouraging us to keep on praying. Many times we try to live our life not putting ourselves in a bad position. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, right? I don't want to put myself in a compromising situation or a bad position. But can I tell you, if we're going to win at parenting and we're going to win at life, it's got to be more than just avoiding bad, but it's about positioning your life to win. And when you position your life in prayer, when you position your life to pray on a regular basis, you start positioning your life to win at parenting. Parenting. You start positioning your life to win at marriage. You start positioning your life to win at the workplace. You start positioning your life to win wherever you go because you're living in a position of prayer. So let me give you three things when it comes to this that we're going to hit really, really quick. First thing is this, parents, as we're positioning our life in prayer, let them catch you doing the right thing. Let them, let your kids catch you doing the right thing. I remember being little and my parents would put us in bed and I didn't know this, but when I went to bed, the party started happening. That's when all the good food came out. I would go to bed and my parents are having pizzas or they made nachos and I come out and I'm like, dad, I, I, you know, <laughs> I can't sleep. I've got a cough and I feel bad. And they would be eating something, Taco Bueno, and you would have thought they were looking at porn. What are you doing up? And they're like trying to hide stuff and like, oh my gosh, what what are you doing? (laughs) Are you eating pizza? (laughs) Oh my gosh, you're eating pizza? (laughs) You know, is that Taco Bueno? (laughs) Don't worry, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Go back to bed, right? (laughs) I caught them eating the good stuff without me. (laughs) And parents, we try not to get caught doing bad things. Let's flip the script. When's the last time your kid caught you in prayer? Really, when's the last time your kids just saw you praying or saw you in the word? I'm not saying like, everybody, I'm gonna go pray now because I'm so godly, you know, and like, Oh God, you know, help Kevin Kunkel right now. He needs, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, let him catch you being consistent in your prayer life. Consistent in doing the right thing. The second thing I would say is prayer changes them and you. James chapter five, verse 13 through 16. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. I love how James 5, 16 out of the Amplified reads, it says, therefore confess your sins to one another, your false steps, your offenses, and pray for one another that you may be healed and restored. The heartfelt, and check this, and persistent prayer of a righteous man, a believer, is able to accomplish much when put into action and made effective by God. It is dynamic and can have tremendous power. Why would we not do that? Why would we not be consistent in that? I love what my wife says. Uh, Casey goes out every morning, even when it's freezing. Why it's dark out, she bundles up. um, And she just gets out and she prays in the morning. And she says this. She goes, when I pray, I realize, it makes me understand and realize I'm an ordinary woman who gets to sit with an extraordinary God. I'm an ordinary mom, and anything I do that is extraordinary is because of him because I'm abiding and remaining in him, because apart from him, I can do nothing. Can I tell you, if you think you can't, you're right. If you feel really ordinary, man, you're in a great place. Because when you pray, it makes an ordinary person turn into an ordinary, being able to accomplish extraordinary feats. It takes your, 
takes you from being an ordinary dad to doing extraordinary things because it's not about you. It's about if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will produce much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. When you learn to spend time in the presence of the extraordinary God, I'm gonna tell you all you college students and all you teenagers, extraordinary things begin to happen. I'm gonna tell you single people and I'm gonna tell you married people. When you spend time in the presence on a regular basis with an extraordinary God, man, extraordinary things begin to happen. Not because of you, but because prayer changes you and it changes other people. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective and we've got to make sure that we are positioning our life in a place where we are being effective and consistent in our prayer life. The last thing I would say is never stop praying. First John chapter 5, verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And have you stayed persistent in your prayer? Because the reality is some of us, we've stopped. Some of us watching at home online today, you stopped. You got discouraged. You got upset because life doesn't look like what you thought it was going to look. You know how to handle this. You got burned out. Maybe you just forgot. Hear me, this isn't a judgment zone. This is a call to action. This isn't me saying, oh, you're a horrible parent. This is, no, no, no. Come on, guys. We can, we can do this. This is a call for us to get in the game and position our life on a daily basis because there's way too much at stake for us not to position our life in prayer. You want to know how the most powerful position you can position your life in is staying in a position of prayer. Staying in the presence of an extraordinary God is, who is capable of achieving extraordinary Things. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, the whole entire verse says this, never stop praying. Never stop praying. Even when your kid's not where you thought they would be, never stop praying. Even though you're waiting for them to still pop, never stop praying. Even though you're not seeing the results you want to see, never stop praying. Can I tell you, Nate Gorman, who got baptized, last person to get baptized, his parents go to church here. I'm sure there were moments they were going, I don't even know if this is going to work because Nate was in jail probably as much as he was in church when he was older. Yeah, more. (laughs) Is he ever going to get over this addiction? Is he ever really going to get help? Is he ever going to really get real? And I, I talked to his dad. He's like, oh, man, it was hard. I never thought it would look like this. And I go, I don't want your testimony, brother. Right? He's like, I don't want you to have my testimony. He goes, but I never stopped praying. I wanted to. It was hard, but I never stopped praying because I know God's capable of doing extraordinary things. And can I tell you, I don't know where your kid is. I don't know where your heart is. I don't know what your situation is. You may not have kids. You may not have that situation. I don't know where your grandkids is. I don't know what your finances look like. I don't know what your marriage looks like. But dear God, don't stop praying. Don't stop positioning your life in the presence of an extraordinary God who can do extraordinary things in your life. Never stop praying. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, never stop praying. You're discouraged never stop praying. You're depressed, never stop praying. You don't know what to do, don't stop praying. Man, you're crying yourself at sleep at night, don't stop praying because the Lord's capable of doing immeasurably and above and beyond what you could ever ask, what you could ever think, and what you could ever imagine. And this is a way better way for you and I to go through and parent in the 21st century. Let's pray today. Lord, we love you. God, there's no guarantee Every kid looks different. Every situation is different. And Lord, a lot of times it feels like we're in the dark just trying not to fall down, trying not to screw up too bad. And Lord, I pray for every parent that's in this place, every parent that's watching at home, every grandparent that, Lord, right now, you would give them a heart of wisdom. God, for that parent that's discouraged, God, I pray today that they would not stop praying. Lord, they'd keep positioning their life in prayer. 
God, I pray for that parent. Lord, maybe, maybe they're just not being as genuine and real as they need to be. God, I pray that you would speak to their heart about being consistent. Because, Lord, there's power in consistency. Lord, we always don't want to pay the price of faithfulness, but we always want what it yields and what it produces. But, Lord, let us be faithful and consistent in our parenting. Lord, let us own a role today. Let us understand who you've called us to be. God, sometimes that's hard. Sometimes it's easy. But Lord, don't let us vacate it and just hope that it works out. That's a horrible strategy. That's an unwise strategy to live our life with. Let us own up to how you've called us and you've directed us and you've instructed us to live our life. Lord, let us be people of prayer. I pray, help us. Help our kids. It's in Jesus' wonderful name I pray.